This is the Smoke Meat Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Pittman. Today, we've got such an amazing guest. This man is racing royalty. Uh, comes from a family that's just steeped in racing tradition. Helped build the sport. Helped make it great. And he continues to do the same thing. Uh, he's a great guy. Big family man. Uh, philanthropist. Uh, has a camp called Victory Junction. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Does a charity ride across America. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And just going to have a great time. So I know you didn't come here to hear my voice. So I'm going to stop running my pie hole. And we're going to talk to the legendary Kyle Petty here on Smoked Meat. Well, good morning, Kyle. How are you doing, man? I am doing great. Doing great today. Outstanding, man. If I was any better, I'd be twins this morning. <laughs> That's a good place to be, man. That's a good place to be. Yeah, I tell you, man, it's just I'm loving life. I get to do what I love, and it's it's just a good day. I'm, Listen, I'm, that, that's been my life for about sixty two years, man. <laughs> um, so now I I tell people all the time, I never never had a job. I, I, I drove for for Felix one time. And he built a brand new race shop um, and I drove for him for like seven or eight years. And he, and he gave me an office and in the seven or eight years I was there, uh, I had my name on the door, was furnished, all this stuff, but I never went through the door, <laughs> never went in office because to have an office means you have a job and to have a job means it's not fun anymore. It should never be a job. It should always be enjoyment. Exactly. That's why I never monetize this thing. Because I do this for my therapy. I'm a paramedic full time, and this is how I wash away the bad days. Yeah, it's good. Good for you, Matt. And you know, I may have a sponsor here and there. Like I had a candle company that I like their candles. They had motor oil, gasoline, and campfire. And I worked out a deal with them. They sent me candles. I talked about them. It was fun, but that was just a fun thing to do. Yeah, but that's because you liked them, man. Not because not because of any other reason. See, once again, it goes back to just having a good time and enjoying life. Exactly. Exactly. And man, I tell you, you know, I, I do a little bit of research on my folks. You know, I didn't have to do a lot on you because I've been a fan since I was a kid. You know, I'm 50 years old and, you know, dad introduced me to NASCAR when I was just a little young. And man, your, your family, the dynasty just, man, there's nothing I can say that hadn't been said 500 times. And listen, it, it, it's funny. I tell people, I, I tell people all the time, my granddad didn't start racing until he was in his latter 30s. Um, before that, he did a little bit of everything. Um, grew tomatoes, raised hogs, run moonshine, whatever it took to put, put food on the table. But it's so funny because um, I think when you say your family's a dynasty, I think that just means we've been around a long time. So you could also say your family's a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, and Dynasty and Dinosaur kind of go in the same area. It's just my granddad started in the late 40s, and, you know, we still have a race team. You know, here we are in 2022, and we still have a race team. We're still doing the same thing. I don't know if Dynasty implies intelligence, because we probably should have got out of this business and got into another business a long time ago. Uh, but, yeah, we, we've just been around a long time. I wouldn't call it a Dynasty. i just say we've been around a long time. Yeah, and what, what makes me – the most proud and happy to, you know, now that I'm, I'm getting to know you, I tell everybody this shows me making friends and having people listen. And the fact I'm making a friend with you is, you know, you're not just taking this and saying, okay, I'm Richard Petty's son. I'm Lee Petty's grandson. I'm famous. Love me and adore me. You're doing something with it, man. Victory junction and the charity ride, yeah. dude, you got my heart right there. Cause yeah. kids, Oh man, I got, my soft spot for sure. You know what? And, and it's funny. I think I got a lot of that. Um, and I tell people this all the time. I, I got a lot of that, that part of it from, from my mom's side of the family. Um, yeah. I got the racing from my dad's side, but I got a lot of this from my mom's side of the family is, is my grandmother Owens, my mother's mother. Um, she worked in a mill her whole life, uh, in Randall. Uh, and, and that's what Randleman is where we grew up. It was a mill town. You either worked in the mill or you lived outside of town and you work, your, your family had a tobacco farm or a dairy farm or a chicken farm. Uh, it was just rural North Carolina. That, that's what it is. Yeah. And, you know, but she always felt like that she was blessed to have a job. She was blessed to be, be where she was. And 
you know, she used that job at the meal for, you know, she'd get secondhand jeans and our, our um, seconds in the jean part and, and socks because they, they weigh, that was a hosiery meal and they wove socks too. And she would take them to, and give them away at Christmas and give them away at different times um, and to, to, to kids and the families that were less fortunate than she was. And she always looked at it and said, man, you got to use what you got and you do the best you can with it. And I've always thought about that as, you know, you use racing. Racing is the platform. Um, you know, people know who my granddad is. People know who my dad is. People, people kind of know who I am, knew who Adam was. So use that as a platform to help other people. Um, if you don't use it as a platform, then it's a waste. Um, and, and we've been very, very, very fortunate. Yeah. And success and, my grandfather had and my dad had, um, and to be able to turn it into to a camp where we've seen over a hundred thousand kids. That that is crazy to me. Since Adam's accident in two thousand and two since we opened the gates in two thousand four, mm-hmm. we have touched the lives of over a hundred thousand kids and their families totally free of charge. And that just that blows me away, man. That, that blows me away. And I tell people all the time, when I see these kids leave camp and they got that smile on their face, I know Adam's still here with me. Uh, I may have lost one child, but uh, I've gained 100000 So that that is extremely important. Between that and the motorcycle ride, which raises money to, to send these kids to camp, uh, mm-hmm. those are the two most important things for me. Yeah, I tell you, you know, I, I believe no kid should have any bad memories. You know, and to – I remember going to camp when I was a kid, you know, we were poor and I knew it took a lot for my mom to send me to Boy Scout camp or, you know, wherever we would go. And I don't know how she did it because my dad died when I was 10 and we were poor. I mean, we were almost so poor enough to where we had to share mouthwash. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and the experiences there and the fact that these kids who have these things going on in their life that no kids should ever have to deal with can just go there and be a kid. That is just amazing. That, that, and you know, that, that's the thing. I don't, I don't care where you are. Um, and, and I've said this before, I, I don't care for me, children, children, do, they don't know the economic scale. Um, and they, they don't know where they they fit in. Um, and they don't have to fit in. That's the whole problem, man. Yeah. Uh, how many times when you're growing up that the, the, your teachers or, or somebody say, you know, act like a grown up. You need to you need to act like you're you're a six year old. Well, that's what I am doing. That's why I'm bouncing on the couch. I'm acting like I'm a six year old. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I you, you should be allowed to have that time to be a kid. But so many kids, especially kids with health issues, all right, they spend so much time in the adult world of medicine um, and, and in hospitals and, and being poked and prodded that they miss some of that opportunity to be a kid. So that is, for me, that is the, that's a big thing is to stop, uh, take a step back and just let these kids, man, if they want to throw mashed potatoes at each other during, during lunch break, I'm good with that. We'll clean it up. There's somebody here to clean it up. Just let them be a kid for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And man, that just, that if, if you never do anything else, man, you've, you've left a mark right there. You know, that's, that's a hundred thousand lives that's been touched and just, will never be the same. And here, here's the funny part. And I thank you so much for saying that. But here is the funny part is, is I look at it that there's 100,000 lives that have left a mark on me. Um, and, and I look at it, at it exactly backwards from, from the way most people do when they talk to me about it because they have changed my life. Uh, these kids changed my life. Everyone I meet, everyone I talk to, every every Tuesday, Wednesday when I go to camp during the summertime, uh, when you're able to visit the hospitals, these kids they put life in perspective for you, and they and and you learn something from these kids all the time. So, um, and and that I look at it. Here's a hundred thousand opportunities for these kids to go out and, and pay it forward and do the same thing in somebody else's life. And uh, I can tell you what. I am thoroughly convinced that it'll be a hundred percent participation because that's the kind of kids these are. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I've, I've been a paramedic for 32 years. I've dealt with a lot of sick kids and kids with chronic illnesses and cancer and things, you know, and it's amazing how tough they are because, you know, we have to start IVs on them and everything. And those hurt. I mean, I'm a grown man and they hurt. I don't like them. And I'll go to stick some of these kids and I'm looking for a vein and they'll just point and say, 
They usually get me right here. It's pretty easy. Over here is a little bit harder, but it's a better one. And just little adults about it. And it just, man. Yeah. It's just their, that's their life. You know, that's their normal. Um, yeah. And that's a, that, that, that is a, that we can't comprehend it sometimes as adult, as adults. You know, we don't understand it, um, uh, how they deal with it. But, you know, they, they, it comes so natural to them. So natural because they've done it their whole lives. Because as, as you said, they are chronic illnesses. They are, are, are serious illnesses and they're illnesses that, that you don't get over in a week that, that lasts for years and years and sometimes a lifetime. So they learn to live with it and it becomes their normal. Um, where if, if it, you know, you see the same thing in an adult who, who is diagnosed with, with a form of cancer or something, uh, and to them, it's the end of the world. To them, it's the end of the world. Um, you know, everything that happens to them a lot of times, and 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 a lot of them have great attitudes. That's not, I, I'm not painting a broad brush of everybody. Yeah. But adults deal with things different than children do. And children are just incredibly resilient. Um, and it, it gives you hope that that the world's in a good place because these kids will will make things happen that we can't only dream of. Yeah, yeah. I tell everybody they're tougher than a fifty cent steak. I mean, exactly. And it it makes me feel good because I mean, you you know as well as I do, it's not the world that we grew up in. You know, and to to know that there are kids out there who are this strong, who are gonna gonna be our leaders one day, who are gonna take care of us. That's a good feeling because, I mean, I I don't do politics by no stretch, so. Yep. But I got you, man. I got you. At the same time, I think when participation trophies happy happened, I can tell I'm getting older because I'm whining about participation trophies. <laughs> you know, that's when things started going down. You know, when I was a kid playing ball, if you were in last place, we still got a trophy, but everybody else got these big trophies. Ours was basically a small version of the guy on the big trophies on top of the wood base. That's it. It yeah. was just something that said T-ball on it. That was it. Yeah, that's right. We knew that's if right, we man. wanted to win, if we wanted to get better, we had to work at it. And that was a goal. Now everybody's just giving to them, and I hate that. But these kids yeah. know nothing's free, nothing's nothing's guaranteed in life. And they take that and run with it. Yeah, these, that, Listen, these kids that come to camp, they work for everything they get. Yeah. They, work, they work to walk across the living room sometimes. They work uh, to get up out of bed in the morning. You know, it's, it is a... It is a constant, it's a, it's uphill. Everything that they do is uphill. Um, but you know what? They, they never stop trying to reach the top of that hill. That's the fascinating part, yeah. you know, and, and you, listen, you go off on participation ribbons. I, I'm, I'm right there with you, dude. The only way to learn to win is to learn to lose. Exactly. Um, and, and I, I tell people all the time, people, people look at my dad and they're like, man, he won 200 races. I said, yes, you're exactly right. And he lost 982, okay, 982. <laughs> so it, it, those 982 taught him to be appreciative of those 200. Um, if, if he had gotten a trophy and a check for those other 982, those 200 wouldn't have been special. And some of those 200 wouldn't have been special at all. Yeah. So there, there's a reason. There's a reason that, that people work hard. There's a reason that you try to be the best. And you got to have somebody out there listen. You got to have a Richard Petty. You got to have a Dale Earnhardt. You got to have a Jeff Gordon and a Jimmy Johnson, um, or everything just gets. Everybody gets a participation ribbon, and everything gets kind of dumbed down. You got to have somebody to shoot at. You got to have somebody to aspire to be. You got to have that hero out there on the, on top of that mountain that you're trying to knock off. And um, we're lucky and very blessed in our sport to have had, you know, four or five of the greatest race car drivers in my, in my opinion, that ever walked the face of the earth. And and my dad and Earnhardt and Jeff and Jimmy and guys like that, because they just, they constantly got it done, constantly moved the needle. Um, and they, I can bet you dollars to donuts that they never received a participation ribbon in their life, in their yeah. life. And if they did, they threw it down and walked off yeah. uh, because they knew where they stood in, in the pecking order. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, that's one thing I love about racing. You know, everybody works their butts off on it. And yeah, the fans for racing, you know, I love college football. 
I don't root for one specific team. I should be a Bulldog fan, but, you know, I, I like everybody. But with racing, you were either a Dale Earnhardt fan or you were a Jeff Gordon fan. There was no in-between. You couldn't like them both. And both of them were phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, people would get in a fights over it. It was awesome. I know, man. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. That that That's the deal. It is crazy, man. They, that's the passion of the fans, and that's what I love, man. I, I love, I love that part too. Man. You just got to be, no matter what you do, whether you whether you participate, um, whether you're a fan, I don't care, man. Just show me some passion. Yeah. Just show me that that you believe in what you're you're watching. You believe in the people that are doing it. You believe in what's going on, um, and you're willing to, to you're willing to to sit there in the grandstands and suffer just like those people. You know what I mean? That's what's cool about it. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I haven't watched a lot of racing in the last several years. Just like I say, I was raised back in the seventies watching it where when you got points, it was Winston cup, you know, and you got points <laughs> because you were leading the race. You got them because of how fast you were going and that. Now there are so many different variations on, okay, you can get points for this, but he didn't do as well, but he got more points than you. And it just, Go fast. Use your strategy. Do it right. Win. Get the cup. That's my thing. Yeah. And plus, the old cars had more character. The old Thunderbirds, the old Plymouths, the old Buick Grand Nationals. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Those had oh, character. Yeah. <laughs> they look like cars. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and they look, and, and you, it's like you said, they look like a Buick. They look like an Oldsmobile. They look like a Plymouth. They look like a Dodge. They look like all that stuff. Here, Here's the funny part. Um, when, when, you talk about that old stuff, man. That old stuff was was cars, and you had the ability to work on it. You had the ability to make it run faster. You had the ability to to bend the rules. Let's just call it bending. The rules. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cre- creative it, it, fabrication. Yeah. yeah, it made um, it made you it made it made you be creative. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now we're back to. Now we're back to when when you look at, at people that do this stuff now, and, and you're back to the, the participation ribbon. These guys show up, and it's already given to them in, in a box. All they have to do is put it all together, and then they go out and they do the best they can with the box that they're given. Mm-hmm. But they're not able to change the box. They're not able to fix the box. They're not able to make things things go. And you go back to that point system, man. Listen, I, I, told, I, I told the guys at NASCAR one day, I said, I think you guys are just just trying to make the math skills of the average American better because you've got it so complicated now. Only only rocket scientists can keep up with it, man. Because yeah. it's so it's so complicated. I can watch a race and and you got to explain to me how the fifth place guy in points or the fifth place guy in the race got more points got more points than anybody else. I just said, I just don't understand that kind of stuff, man. So it is, it's a crazy game. Yeah. And I'll tell you what my favorite racing in the world is. I haven't been to it in a while, but just, I haven't had time. Is when I lived in Athens, we worked a bunch of the small dirt tracks and oh man, to get out there and the guys in little four cylinders, you think, okay, we got a bunch of Pintos rolling around this track. Those things are beasts when somebody knows what they're doing, gets a hold of them. Yeah. But for there, sure. There was one guy that raced a Volkswagen Rabbit against all these Pintos, and he never lost. <laughs> and I had to, his wife were, raced it one night in a powder puff race and wrecked it. We had wound up, she didn't get hurt, but we wound up having to cut her out of the car. And he built another one, but it was just never the same. But oh, that broke my heart when they just, that car was just trashed. Yeah. But, but you know what? That, that, that is, and that's a great point because I, I want to say this. And, and I say this to people all the time because we watch, you know, people come and watch the cup racing and, and all that stuff. And, and I tell people constantly, constantly, um, some of the greatest races and the greatest racing that you'll ever see is at your local dirt track. Yeah. It's, at, at your, it's at your local, local quarter mile, your local half mile. It's those guys that work a job during the week. Um, and build a race car and drag it out to the racetrack on the weekends to just have fun. And they do it because they love, they love racing. 
They love cars. They love racing. They love the racing people. But the other thing is that people get get that I tell people is you don't have to run 200 miles an hour to put on a good race. Mm -hmm. Some of the greatest races you'll ever see are at 55 miles an hour. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. At door to door, three wide, only outside, only inside, leaning on each other a little bit, not taking each other out, not on purpose, but j just leaning on each other and making it happen, man. And, and that is, I, I tell people, speed and racing don't necessarily have to go hand in hand because great racing um, can be anywhere, anywhere on any local short track. That's for sure, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about the guys that do that, you know, through the week, they get off work, they go and work on their cars. And the candle company I was talking about, uh, it was four points trading company. It's out of California. And they sent me a big box of candles, had all their manly scents. And I lit three of them. I lit or actually four of them. I lit bourbon, uh, firewood, oil, and gasoline. When I was in my old studio down in my basement at my old house and I could close my eyes and I was sitting out in front of my buddy's shop on a cold winter <laughs> night. After we'd done been messing with the car some, sitting around the burn barrel. Yeah. Oh yeah. And the best memories that's, in the world. Yeah. That's that's it. That's that is that's the best part about scents like that is they can take you back, man. You close your eyes, you smell, you smell. And listen to this day, to this day, I can get out in the parking lot um, somewhere, and somebody will I'll smell brake dust and, and instantly <laughs> or or out. Uh, you know, the way hot brakes smell yeah. instantly. I'll think of Martinsville, man. Instantly. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm back at Martinsville. I'm a kid sitting down in turn one, watching my dad and Pearson and those guys. Cause those old drum brakes, man, they stunk. Oh man. Um, they were really, they, you could smell them. The whole racetrack smelled like rubber and, and, <laughs> and drum brakes, man. And that was asbestos then. That's, that's before, that's a long time. <laughs> and here's what fascinates you. They got all this, you got all this stuff. These guys, all those guys I know that were working on those cars, a lot of them were still walking around. And I know they had to have breathed tons of asbestos and tons of stuff. Oh, you couldn't kill them guys with a sledgehammer, man. Oh, no. Oh, no. But yeah. I, and just those old memories. Just I've never gotten behind the wheel of a race car. I'm just not a fast guy. I just, I don't know. It's not my thing. I, I love watching it. But the memories of it is just, man, you know, sitting there watching my dad while we're watching it on the TV. Back in the old days, you know, Davey Allison, you know, Bobby yeah. Allison, Kale Yarborough. My dad hated Kale Yarborough with a blue passion. <laughs> oh, man. That's what makes it, though, man. Yeah. yeah let's, hey, here's the fascinating part. And th this has always been this way. I will say this, too, is that, um, you know, to this day, you'll get families that come to the racetrack and, and, you know, it'll be a man and his wife and his two kids. And it might be two boys or two girls or a boy and a girl. It doesn't make any difference. Um, but all four of them pull for somebody else. And I'm like, how do y'all live in the same house and pull for somebody else, man? That exactly. just, that, that fascinates me about this sport as much or more than anything else <laughs> is the way a family of four can pull for four different people. Um, it's just it's amazing, but you know what? It's like you say, they either love them or they hate them, man. There, there's not that. Okay, I'll take these three guys. These will be my three favorites. There's not three favorites. There's only one. Yeah, it don't matter what team you're on. You know, you'd be on the same yep. team and they just hate that driver. I know, man. I know. And you know, it's funny. My my mother in law, God rest her soul, she was almost seventy and watched races religiously. And this little quiet woman, I mean, she was tiny. But when something bad or good would happen to Dale Jr., <laughs> she would turn into a 300-pound man. Oh, oh yeah. Man. Oh, yeah. And it was that's so good, much man. fun watching her watch the race. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's a cool story. <laughs> that's cool. But, yeah, I mean, she was tiny, but when anything happened with Dale, oh, man. Oh, it got nasty. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, and she would hold a grudge too. I mean, if somebody you know put him in the wall or whatever, I mean, accidental or whatever, it didn't matter. Yeah, yeah, they, they were on the blacklist. That there's that that's the funny part. Like you know, today we have Twitter. Okay, so if <laughs> anything happens, 
if anything happens to a driver, their fans can, will go back in time. And it's like the driver doesn't even remember that happening to him. But by goodness gracious, those fans remember. Yeah. I remember that time that he got spun out on the fifth lap of this race and the driver's standing there saying, what are you talking about, man? I don't remember that at all. Oh, yeah, you can go win that race. you know. And, and it was like, it is fascinating how fans remember every every little thing and every slight, um, everything done wrong to their driver. Um, they, they will remember like it was yesterday. Yeah. Oh, in a heartbeat. And can tell you what time during the race it was. It was oh, 18 yeah. minutes past that last pit. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Oh, that's really? good. <laughs> I don't even remember the last pit. Leave me alone. <laughs> but man, I, I appreciate everything that you do. I mean, it's, it is so much fun sitting here talking to you. And I've, you know, I, when you come to Atlanta, you got to come over to the cook shack because oh, where uh, my cook shack, I live 10 miles South of Atlanta motor speedway. You look, that's Griffin. Yeah. So we used to stay in Griffin. We always used to stay. Uh, when we stayed, when we used to race, in, in Atlanta, when when we had Petty Enterprises, and it was my dad and and um, it was my dad back. In, if we go back in the eighties, back in the nineties and stuff, um, we stayed down in Griffin, man. I think there was a Holiday Inn we stayed at down there. Eventually, exactly we moved over about. towards. Yeah, eventually we moved over to to Fayetteville because we had some friends that that moved to Fayetteville, so we moved over towards Fayetteville, Georgia. Yeah, but I I, man, man, we yeah, we must have stayed in we must have stayed in Griffin for golly, man. I, I know we stayed there 20, 25 years. We never stayed anywhere but there. I remember the first TCBY that I ever ate at, the first <laughs> <laughs> yogurt place I ever ate at was was they had one in Griffin. That's the first time I ever had TCBY, man. And I I, I was bound and determined I was gonna move to Griffin, Georgia, and just eat TCBY all the time, man. Oh, because yeah. that was like a, that was amazing stuff when it come out. But yeah, we stayed there forever, ever and ever. When I drove for the Wood Brothers back in the eighties, we stayed there. Oh. Um, so I, I know Griffin well, man. I know well, Griffin. What, what's your favorite kind of barbecue? You know? All right. So here's the thing. This is going to be good. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I – listen, I like I, – I grew up on North Carolina barbecue, mm -hmm. which is full pork, vinegar base, um, red coleslaw um, is, is, is what we have in our part of the state. Mm -hmm. And and I'm in I'm in the central part, so that's Lexington barbecue. Mm -hmm. That is that's that's the center part. Um, I've got one of my best friends moved from Texas, and I'd never had brisket in my life, or the way they do barbecue. Mm -hmm. And it's like, man, that's tough to beat. They call it barbecue, but it's not it looks like anything I eat. You know what, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then you get, then you go to Memphis, you know, and you got dry ribs. And you go to Kansas, and you got all that. We race all those places. So yeah. I'm kind of I, I don't know what kind of barbecue I like best. You, you know what I mean? Because it depends on where I'm at on on, on what I like best. Yeah. Um, because it's just it, there's so that barbecue is the one meal. I tell people this all the time. Barbecue is the one meal that you can leave California. And if you just everywhere you stop for lunch or for dinner, if you just say, I'll take the barbecue, you'll get a different meal. Every time you sit down, yep. don't, don't, you just get, all you got to do is say barbecue and you'll get a different meal. What kind do you got? What kind do you cook? I cook every kind. I, I love doing pulled pork. Um, I love doing yeah. brisket. Uh, I make my own sausage. I do brats on I, I've got a venison pastrami that I make. That'll make you smack your mama. No way. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Hey, I, so, I just, I just remembered something, man. I just remember something. Yeah. So, when we used to race in Atlanta, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just remembered this, man. We're talking about barbecue. When we used to race in Atlanta, we would stop back. We, we never made it home on a Sunday night after a race in Atlanta. Never. As long as I was growing up back in the 60s, it seems like all the way through the 70s, I know. That we wouldn't stop up in Atlanta at a place called the Hickory House. Uh -huh. my, dad would, my dad would eat. I, he'd eat his weight in barbecue ribs. Man, that man loves some barbecue ribs. He loves king crab legs and barbecue ribs. That's two things. Listen, if, if he was if he was a criminal and they were giving him his last supper, he'd eat his weight and, and barbecue ribs and king crab legs. And we at that place, 
I, I, I hadn't thought about that place in a thousand years until we we're just talking about barbecue here. Um, mm-hmm. But we would stop, man, and that whole car on the way home would smell like barbecue ribs. Well, you know, but that's it, where they, they, that was the choking puke it on, on uh, Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah. Yes. 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 I forgot all about that too, man. I forgot <laughs> yeah. all about that. But oh, my, yeah. man, my dad loved that joint. He loved that place, man. Golly. Yeah, but no, man. Whenever when when y'all come down for Atlanta, um, bring your people out here to Cook Shack, and whatever y'all want, it will be cooked better than you've had it anywhere else. I guarantee that one. Listen, I will stay in touch for sure. What what's uh, are you, you off the main road there? What is that? Um, I'm off 19? uh I'm off 16 when you See, leaving okay. uh Griffin going toward Jackson out toward 75. Okay, I'm off of that. Okay. Okay, I got where you're at. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. I got it. All right, man. That sounds good. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it now. I'm ready for him to run Atlanta first next year. Man, like I say, all you got to do is let me know. So, hey, I'll be there. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, you, you'll have to get wheeled out of here. You'll be that full. <laughs> uh, now you're talking. There you go. I went to a – I do a show. I do another show on the Circle Network. Mm-hmm. And um, it's called Dinner Drive. And I came up with this idea and it's, it's, it was crazy. I'm not a, I know you're going this well, I'm going down a rabbit hole right here. That's okay. Um, I, I know I'm not a car guy. Mm-hmm. I know that sounds extremely crazy coming from me uh, since I grew up and that's all I, that's what I did. Mm-hmm. I'm a motorcycle guy. I yeah. love motorcycles. Just always have my whole life. Um, the coolest car I ever saw was a 1970 Superbird that my dad drove, the wing car. Oh, yeah. And once I saw that car, every car since that time in my life has been downhill. It's, it's Nothing has lived up to that. A <laughs> nine-year-old, 10-year-old, when you dream of that car and then you see it, it's like, oh, my gosh, man, I have been to Mount Everest. There's Everything is below that. You know what I mean? So I don't yeah. care. People talk all these fancy cars, but I, I just like that. So I came up with this idea. To, to talk to celebrities to find out what was their most sentimental car. What's your most sentimental car? Not your, not your baddest car, not your most expensive car, not, not any, what is a car to you that is sentimental that every time you see it, every time you think of it, it just stirs some kind of deep memory for you. And it has been fascinating, man. It has been fascinating. I did, I did stuff with, um, uh, um, I've, I've done Darius Rucker, um, Lyle Lovett, Jeff Gordon, um, my gosh, man, Rick Hendrick, uh, Richard Petty, Mario Andretti. Mario Andretti's most sentimental car, mm-hmm. and, and, and a lot of people don't understand this. Mario Andretti grew up in Europe, or was born in Europe, um, and moved to America, or was born before, or right, there, right just before World War II. Um, and he lived in Italy, but they lost the war. So where he lived in Italy was annexed and turned into Croatia. So he was forced to leave where he was born. His family was, and they were put in a refugee camp. He, he spent seven years of his life in a refugee camp Hmm. and his most sentimental car is a dark blue 1940 Ford that the American doctor who would drive into they would open the gates of the refugee camp and he would drive in in this huge american car and to to mario andretti that car signified america that car signified every dream that he had of being a race car driver and when they first moved to america when they were 15 years old his dad went out and found and that was in the 50s it was in the mid 50s his dad went out and found a 1940 ford because that's the car that meant America to them. And that's such a cool story. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it is, it's, so that's what it's about. And then we have dinner. So it has been cool to sit down with people. And just like we're talking here, is to relive those Pitbull, who's a, who's a huge rap star, a huge singer. His is a 1976 Ford Pinto. He grew up in <laughs> Miami. Uh, his parents were Cuban refugees, and that's all they could afford. And they lived in an apartment that was so hot that in the middle of the night, sometime, his mom would wake up the kids and put them in this 76 Ford Pinto 
and roll the windows down and ride around town to keep them cool so that they would be rested to go to school the next day so that they would sleep in the car at night, which is a crazy story. Crazy story. Here's a guy worth billions of dollars now. And that that's his childhood. And that is a car that means more to him than anything else. When he thinks back on his childhood, uh, Lyle Lovett had the first pickup that he dated his wife in. You know, that was just something that, and, and you get a couple of those, you know, Dale Jr. Had an S10 pickup. Mm. It was his very first car that his dad, that his dad gave him. So, um, so doing those stories is the same thing we're doing here. You just sit and you talk to somebody. And I, I don't know these people when I sit down to talk to them. But when you leave, you feel like, man, they let me glimpse inside their life a little bit. You know what I mean? And, and, and now we have a connection and now we're friends. But uh, I started down that road to tell you a barbecue story. Mm-hmm. Is my man, I did a deal with Lyle Lovett in, in Spring, Texas, north of Dallas. And he said that he was sitting there watching the Food Channel one night while he was on tour. And they had they came on and said, tonight, the top 10 barbecue places, best barbecue in Texas. And he said, well, this is going to be good. That's you know, the he said, I, of his racing. Yeah. He's, and he said, this is, this is going to be good. So he said he, uh, he sat there and he watched and he watched and he watched. And it got down to number one. And he said it listed listed every one of the cliche places that everybody says you got to go to Austin and eat at this place. You got to go to Dallas. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Every one of them. And he said he, could, he was racking his brain trying to think of what number one could be. And he said, they said, number one is corkscrew barbecue in spring, Texas. And he said he almost fell off the chair. He said he was from King spring, Texas. That's where he lives right mm-hmm. now in spring, Texas. And he said, I've never heard of corkscrew barbecue. You know what I mean? (laughs) And I live in spring, Texas. So he said, as soon as he got home, he went to find corkscrew barbecue and it was a food truck. This, this couple had had started a food truck and they were just looking for a building to move their, their restaurant into. It's now in a building, Mm -hmm. but the, the, the barbecue that came out of this food truck and the way they cooked it, it was rated the best. And listen, man, I will say this. It was it was really good barbecue. It was, it was really good barbecue. It come back around and they serve every. They don't do pulled pork as good as they do in the South. I will mm. say that. Uh, but everything else was was top notch. But it's it's fascinating. Um, that that show has been fascinating to be able to see everybody barbecue is almost everybody's favorite meal, which oh, yeah. just fascinates me too. The only one that was different was John Oates, and he wanted breakfast, so we had <laughs> breakfast with him. I love breakfast. I'll shoot you. Oh yeah. Barbecue for breakfast would be great. I've done that yeah. more than once. Oh, more than <laughs> we've all done. If you've been on the road, you've done a little bit of everything for breakfast, man. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. But yeah, you, you hit Atlanta, man. I like I say, if you got, you know, just yourself or you got 30 people with you, let me know in advance. We'll, we'll get cooking we'll do. done. Most I, definitely. I for sure will. I for, I for sure will. I will stay in touch. All right. All right. Outstanding. Well, man, I appreciate you coming on the show a whole lot, brother. I appreciate you having me, man. Mm-hmm. I've enjoyed this. It's right. brought back some good memories. I, I appreciate it. Anytime <laughs> I can talk to somebody that brings back some memories, that's always a plus, man. You did it today, so yeah, I appreciate it. That's, that's why I don't like to ask all the same things, because <laughs> <laughs> no. But very cool.